But let's, uh, let's get in the Word of God together. Can we do that? Um, you know, I'm excited to walk with Jesus. Anybody excited to walk with Jesus? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really just, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, you know, why, why can't we do whatever God has asked us to do? Why can't we? Right? Uh, have you ever heard stories of God using people before? You know, Smith Wigglesworth had this incredible ministry. He was a plumber. He didn't start his healing ministry. He was 50 years old. So for you of those who are getting a little older in life, it's never too late to start walking with Jesus in a, in a new level of ministry. Uh, there have been those who were engaged in, um, in God, and you're never too young. I remember hearing the story of a little six-year-old girl, and, and she was used in tongue and interpretation and spoken fluent uh, Cherokee language to get a hold of an individual who was, was, was not in a relationship with God, and God used a six-year-old child in a, in a prophetic gift. And, and anywhere in between, Evan Roberts, he was in his 20s, and he was used in a uh, great way in the Welsh River. William Booth, he was still in his 20s when he began to, when he began to raise up teenagers, and, and through that founded the Salvation Army, had an incredible impact in the world. And, and you look, and people just started walking with God. You're never too young, you're never too old. You're right where you are right now, and, and now's the, better, the best opportunity. Today's the best opportunity. Today's, today's the best moment. Today's the, the best time to make a decision to follow Jesus. It doesn't matter where you've been or, or how long you've been there. Uh, when you go on with God, you realize that he makes changes that are impossible except through him. Amen? Is anybody ready to go on with God this morning? You know, um, we, we might have seen the same thing for the last 30 years when we're coming into church here, but, but in a moment, God can, can change something because we, we, we serve a God who's faithful. We serve a God who's good. We serve a God who's all-powerful and all-sufficient, and he has all resource that's necessary. He's asking us to do something. I'm, I believe with all my heart, God's just waiting for us to move, that God wants to move. I believe that God wants to do something. I believe that God wants to bless, but he can't bless outside of obedience, and he wants us to walk in obedience. Amen? Amen. If you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to continue the series, Walk This Way. Amen? Walk This Way. How'd it go this morning, Kenny? Good. Good. It went well. Better than that. Yeah. <laughs> Jose, how'd it go? It went, well. it went great. Amen. People, people encouraged. Yeah. You know a cool testimony? Here, here's, here's Kenny and... Kenny's story is, you know, just God working his life. The last couple of years, God really doing an incredible thing in Kenny's life. And I get texts from time to time from Kenny and just like, like, you know, I, I preached a sermon one time. I was like, uh, I want to win. And he texts me the next day. He's like, I want to win, Pastor John. I want to win. I want to go on with God. I want to grow. And he'll, he'll be running all these things and put together these spoken words and such. I'm reading I'm like this. God's working in Kenny's life. Thank God for that. He, he's changing oil. He seemed like, by the way, some people think, and I was talking to, to, to a pastor, he's a founding pastor of a church in the area here, a pastor for 40 years, the church is over 500 people now, and he ended up moving into a different ministry of, of, of overseeing the church's networking together. And I was sitting together yesterday with him for breakfast, and he said, um, so often people think that, that a call to ministry is a call to full-time ministry and, and like paid staff salary, and that's often what goes in our mindset, and it, and it messes up actually what God wants to do inside the church, because we think, well, I got a call to preach, so I need to go to Bible college, and then I need to become a pastor of a church, something like that. There's something called lay ministry, and God wants to raise up lay leaders in the church. God wants us... To, to be preachers. He wants us to be teachers. He wants us to be evangelists right in the local church. That just because God has a call in your life for ministry doesn't mean that, that it has to be a paid position. And it might be, but, but to understand that God wants us all to be ministers. He wants us to minister, whether we're changing oil or whether we're changing tires or whether we're, we're changing teeth. <laughs> Some people make dentures. I'm telling you, you know, we got dentists around. You know, so... Uh, <laughs> Whether we're, we're working as a nurse or whether we're working as a doctor or whether we're working as a technician or whether we're working as a fisherman, whether we're working as whatever profession it is, that, that's a place and that's an opportunity for God to be glorified. God can't use you where you're not. He can only use you where you are. And, and so many of us want to be where we're not and we're not effective where we are. But if we could learn to be effective where we are and bloom where we're planted, then other people would be able to participate in the fruit that's coming off of our lives and be blessed. God wants us to be a blessing. Amen? Amen? He wants us to be a blessing. So Kenny's changing oil one day. A, a, a particular individual comes in. He gets talking with him. He finds out he's a pastor. He's like, 
God's got a call in your life to preach. I want you to come preach at my church. Came out of changing oil. So Kenny went and preached at the church this morning uh, because he was faithful in, in changing oil to be a witness to Jesus Christ. God will use you. You know what the Bible says? A man's gift will make room for him. You don't need to push doors open. God will open doors. I've learned that in my life. I've never had to push one door open in my entire life. Sometimes I've had to been dragged through doors because I'm too slow moving, but I've never had to open a door. <laughs> but um, God will open the doors at the right time. So many people that are pushing on doors, they're pushing on doors, you know, just pushing on doors. It's like, why don't you just wait for God to open it up and walk through it? And you'll find sometimes you're going to walk into those places where it seems like it's obstacle and, and God's got to open door for you. There might be adverse, adversity and adversaries, but God's got to open doors for you. Amen. Uh, we're going to just look at continue to walk this way. The, the way we're walking is a, a, a walk that's worthy of the call. And that walk is a worthy call wherever God has called us to. You can be just as good a Christian in your workplace as you can inside the church. We're still good. It might be my batteries that are dying. I'm tired. Um, it's been a long couple of weeks. Got a 5 a.m. start tomorrow driving back and forth to Maine, and then we got a doubleheader softball game. And <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness with long-suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you're called, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, can you say to each one of us? Say that again, to each one of us. Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. I just want to think about this for just a moment. How big was Christ's gift? How big was Christ's gift? Well, well Ephesians 3.20 says, and he shall do immeasurably more than we can ask or think. How big was Christ's gift? Bigger than we can comprehend, right? You ever dealt with a number that was so big you just couldn't wrap your mind around it? You know, like Mathematics. We ever dealing with, you know, I, I love the solar system. I love the, 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 what's going on in the solar system. And, and they, the scientists say there's billions of trillions of stars. Not hundreds of thousands. Not hundreds of millions. Billions of trillions. Billions is a big number by itself, but I'm not talking about, I'm talking about billions of trillions. We're talking about a, a number that if you kept writing zeros, you'd be writing zeros for the rest of your life. Seriously. You, you're not, you wouldn't be old enough to be able to even write the number out. Big numbers. When we deal with God, we deal with infinite. I think part of the reason why the scriptures say, Peter said that, that our life is but a vapor. John Bevere said if we were to count our life, we, we'd call it actually zero. Because it's, it's, anything multiplied by zero is zero. And in, 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 in realm of how small we are in comparison to the length of eternity, even our existence here on this planet is, is equated to zero. It's, it's, it's nothing. It's a blip on the map, and it's so small. It's so insignificant, but the, me the immeasurable measure of God's grace is so huge that we can apply those things in our life now so that we can develop an eternal perspective and not just live for the here and now, which is nothing. It's zero. It's a vapor. It's, it's, it's just here and gone. Anybody with me this morning? If we begin to apply it, that according to Christ's gift, each one of us has received grace. So that tells me this. It's immeasurable what God has poured in every person's life. Some people think, I've only received a little bit. Let me just tell you this. Reception is based upon perception. I said reception is based upon perception. And what we've received is often based upon what we see. We were talking about mindset this morning in Sunday school. How the enemy, the prince of the power of the air, he's blinded the mind of the unbeliever. And many who are in the Christian realm have actually been blinded in darkness so that they're alienated from the life of God. Verse 17 says, through the ignorance that's in them. 
because of the blindness of their heart. They're not receiving what God has for them because they've been, they've been deceived into believing something different than, because what we've received is based upon what we've perceived to be so. If we could see how big God is, we would see that I have way more than I even have access to. Amen. I remember years ago, I was, I was, we were working as youth pastors up in a church in Maine, and I was looking all over the house for my keys. I couldn't find my keys. I'm looking everywhere. I can't find the keys. I need to get to the church. I can't find my keys. And I stick my hand in my pocket. My keys are in my pocket. I think it was a youth group, so I actually, I think I had cargo pants on, so they were maybe in the side pocket, so you know how that goes, and cargo pants used to be cool, that was a long time ago, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and my keys were in there, and, and all of a sudden I said, ah, oh, my keys were in my pocket the whole time, and I didn't know, I said it to my wife, and all of a sudden, it was like the Spirit said, yeah, exactly. You've had access to things you didn't even know you had access to, you had exactly what you thought you were looking for, you're praying for things, but you already got them, why stop praying for them, start walking in them. Amen. Anybody with me this morning? Amen. Start walking out what's been granted to you. Ephesians chapter 1 through 3, we talked about it's dealing with, with doctrinal truths. So verse, verse 3 of chapter 1, and, and God has blessed you in the heavenly places with every spiritual blessing in Christ, that he has given to the church the fullness of him who fills everything. Jesus, he's been given to the church in all his fullness, not just a little bit of Jesus, but Jesus in his fullness has been given to the church. Christ in his fullness has been given to the church. And when he distributed his gift, he's not just given a little bit. There's more than enough for you and for me. There's more than enough for us to leave, more than full. When God does something, he doesn't leave people leaving hungry. They are left full with baskets to take along for the journey. Amen. God is a God who fills. He's given to each one of us grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. There he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. He led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this ascended, what did it mean? That he first descended to the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. So the fullness of him who fills everything wants to fill you. That's pretty good news. Like how much can you fit in it? You know the cool thing about it? It's like we, we got a cup, we got a cup and... Um, but it's like our life, a cup in the ocean. The ocean's in the cup, but the cup is just surrounded, they're surrounded by the ocean too. It's like our life in God. Like we got God in us. We got our God all around us. We got so much of God that we don't even realize that we just, we are saturated. We are absolutely absorbed in the life of God. Amen. Don't you thank God for God's grace? Amen. Don't you thank God that we are just full of him? And therefore, verse 11 says, he gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teaching for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man or a mature man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And God wants us to get to the place where we understand who we are, our position. We we're talking about this this morning, the importance of position. Until you know your position, you keep moving. But you have a position that you need to maintain. There's a position to maintain. And the really cool thing in our relationship with God is much of what's been given to us is not based upon what we do. It's based upon where we are now in him. That our life is, is suited, our life is fixed in a position that's been granted to us by grace, by God. That we have, I have a position, I am saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I have a position, I am filled by the power of God's spirit. I, there's a position that I maintain because God has done something in me. And so I'll hold that position. You've got to protect your position. You've got to be moved. You've got to walk with Jesus. Anybody with me this morning? He wants us to walk. We're going to continue in Ephesians 4 for probably a little while because there's so much in this. It's just, you know... Kenny texted me this week and he's like, man, he's like, I got my pick out. He's like, Ephesians chapter four is a gold mine. <laughs> got a spelunker helmet out and he's ready to go. <laughs> I want to just look at a couple of just brief points here this morning. Number one, and we've talked about this. He says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. If I could ask you a, a, a true question this morning, could you answer truthfully to yourself, because that's the most important thing. You can tell me anything you want, but be, would you be truthful to yourself and truthful to God? Could you say, I'm a prisoner of the Lord? In other words, I'm locked in to do his will. Yes. Could you honestly say that, that I'm a prisoner of the Lord? That like my, my, my life has been brought into subjection to something greater than me. 
And so my affinities are no longer driven by what I want, but I want to do what he wants. Am I a prisoner of the Lord? You know, the greatest thing a believer can do is walk in obedience. I believe obedience is a necessary component of our life, obedience. And so what Paul was saying is there, you know, I am under subjection to one greater than I. I'm in obedience to do whatever God wants me to do. When he was called, he said, this man must suffer great things for my name's sake. And so he, he received that. You don't see Paul complaining about it. You see him praying and, and, and wrestling with the Lord in one particular occasion for, for three times about, can you remove this, this thorn from my side? The suffering. But you don't see Paul complaining and getting edgy. You see him maintaining a position. And you see him fulfilling the role in the ministry of an apostle, which was to engage all in fruitful ministry for reproduction. How many churches did the apostle Paul build? How many leaders did he raise up? Seriously, the call of an apostle, I believe that apostolic ministry should be enacted again in the church. Not this put apostle in front of my name so I can travel around and people can like, oh, wow, look at him. No, but they can actually engage in the ministry of being locked into the will of God so that they could raise up leaders. And those leaders could call them at two o'clock in the morning and say, hey, I'm struggling a little bit. Can you pray with me? Everybody wants the title of apostle. No one wants the ministry of apostle. Like who wants the calls all over the times at crazy times? Who wants to be? I constantly remember you in my prayers without ceasing. I pray for you all the time. Who wants that ministry of apostle? We like the title. We don't like the ministry. Isn't this true? But God wants us to be a prisoner of the Lord. He wants us to be a person who's locked into the will of God. How many people here this morning could say, I want God's will to be done in my life. Even Jesus, he was God, yet he locked himself into a prisoner of the Lord. I don't do anything unless my father tells me to do it. I always do what pleases my father. He's a prisoner to the Lord, wasn't he? He said, prisoner, I don't want to be a prisoner. Who wants to be a prisoner? Most people are walking around locked into their own lusts. Even Christians. Locked into Romans chapter 7. Locked into this, the legal binding of the law. I want to do it, but I can't. I don't want to do it, but I do it. Who's going to ever free me from this? I, I hate it. I'm in this vicious cycle and never really getting where I want to be. So I try harder and I fail more. And then I start thinking, I've got to give up. It's not even worth it. I'm not good enough. I don't fit in. I'm not like everybody else. All these different things that begin to come into my mind. Let's be honest with ourselves. Why? Because I'm still driven by my own desires to do what I want to do. Even a drive to even please God by my own actions. And I've, I've lost the sight of God doesn't want me to, to work harder or try harder or do more. He wants me to be locked into his will and obedience. Whatever it is he wants me to do. We often think we want great things. Well, that wouldn't be, you know, I've heard people actually rebuke God. I've heard pastors say, you know, God says something. I rebuke you, God. He better watch out. I mean, they were joking as such, but they were being honest with themselves. They were saying, you know, I didn't want to do that. God was asking me to do something like that was a little bit crazy. I wasn't comfortable with that. Whatever happened to God asking you to do something, say, whatever you want me to do, God, I'll do it. I'm saying that it's, not, it's an easy thing to say, but it's sometimes a hard thing to live out, isn't it? Obedience. And from this position of obedience, the apostle Paul says, I, I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called in. In fact, this morning, I'm just going to focus on two words in the original language, and, and that will be uh, the message this morning. He says, I beseech you, from the, from the position of obedience, do you know it's tough to call somebody to obedience when you're not living obedience? You ever see parents that say, do what I say, not what I do? No, no they're going to do what you do regardless of what you say. Because we follow the examples of those lives, not what their speech is. The Apostle Paul said, you knew what manner of men we were among you for your sakes. He says, you knew. And, and therefore, I, I encourage you to follow the manner of doctrine which we delivered to you. Because you knew what we were. And so their doctrine was in line with their practice. Their walk was their talk. Walk this way. When they said walk in obedience, he was saying, this is what I've learned. I've learned that in obedience is the safest place to be. In obedience, the blessing and the favor of God is all over me. You might see something different, but I know for sure that I'm pleasing to the one who sent me. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. I'm, I'm obedient to the will of God. Some would say, look at this guy. He's, he's, his speech isn't that good. It's contemptible. He's not as good looking or well dressed as us. He's not living in luxury as we are, as the super apostles of those days, or so they were called. 
And they judged him with man's judgment, but God judges upon the condition of the heart. And he says, I've learned a secret in obedience, and I'm asking you, I'm urging you to walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called in. The word beseech in, in the Greek language is the word parakaleo. Parakaleo, if you're writing notes down, it's P-A-R-A-K-A-L-E-O. Uh, of course, with the, our English letters, parakaleo. And that's really cool about this word. Um, there's a, another word that's in the same family as this, and it's the word paraclete. Anybody ever heard the word paraclete before? It, it, when Jesus said, I'm leaving, but I'm going to send another comforter, another counselor, the word it was paraclete. It was, it was one who would come alongside, and this word parakaleo is, is that same, same, same uh, word. It, it, it's in the same family. It, it's, it means to come alongside. And so when he says, I beseech you, what he's saying is, he's like, I'm coming alongside you. What I'm asking you to do is not what I'm not willing to do, but I want you to walk with me. How many people thank God that, that Jesus came alongside us? He didn't ask us to do anything that he wasn't willing to do himself. Amen. When, when Christ, he says, when, when he asked us to follow in his steps, I, I find this interesting. We often think following in Jesus' steps is like standing behind him, but I think that Jesus wants us to be led beside him. That's why he said, take my yoke upon you. He wants us to learn the secret of learning to walk in step. Learning how to, to move with him, you know? It gets a little awkward at first, but then, but then all of a sudden you learn, oh, this, I, this is the way he walks. This is the way he walks. Walk this way. And the apostle Paul's saying, this is how I'm, I'm beseeching, I'm urging you. Again, not as an apostle, I'm not, I'm not declaring things on you of necessity. I'm encouraging you rather as one who's coming alongside you and saying, walk this way. I'm coming alongside you as an encourager. As an encourager, we talked last Wednesday night about the, the necessity of the ex exhortation ministry. How important is it to be an exhorter, to be someone who encourages, someone, to be someone who comes alongside? See, see, the Pharisees, they developed a religious system, but Jesus said it was defunct, it was broken, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, abnormal because they were not willing to even use one finger to help you lift the burdens that they put upon your shoulders. Right? You, you lay heavy burdens upon men's shoulders and you are not willing even to lift one finger to help out. But I've come to come alongside to tread the tread, to walk the walk, to talk the talk, to, to be an encourager, to be one who, who walks in the journey. That's why it's so important. We had to be beside. This isn't a walk all by ourselves. Amen. The walk of God is a walk. I mean, even this process of discipleship, you learn obedience through being with other people because people are crazy and people will rub you the wrong way and people are irritable, but people are God's creation and people are his highest possession. And God loves them with a love that's way deeper than any love that's natural. And he wants us to learn to be obedient to him and to love without condition, to love just, just it seems like, just absolutely abandoned. Almost said reckless, but not reckless. <laughs> Maybe relentless. Honestly, sometimes our love is reckless. But God wants us to learn to love without condition. Amen? The, the word parakaleo, it means to call to one side, to address, to exhort, to encourage, to strengthen by consolation, to comfort. That when he's, when he's saying this to them, listen, sometimes the greatest encouragement in your life is actually to tell you to do something that you didn't want to do because it's going to save you from a whole lot of heartache and trouble. You understand like, they're, they're, you don't, this is what you want. You gotta, you gotta walk worthy of the calling. I'm not, I'm not demanding something of you. I'm encouraging you, and this is what you really want. Because I know this is, you've expressed to me, this is, this is, what, this is really what you want. The, the word parakaleo is, is a, is a uh, compound word made up of, of two roots. The first is para, um, and it means of, with, from, by, in terms of by the side, besides or near, and the word kaleo, which is to call, to bid, to utter, invite, or in particular, it's to cry out for a purpose. There's a purpose behind it. And so what, what's going on here is to call alongside, to call by one side. The exhortation is to say, I want you to come and, and take a position next to me because I want to show you some things that the Lord's been teaching me. 
And I want to show you that you can walk worthy of the calling you've been called in. I want to show you that God has revealed mystery to me, and I want to unveil that mystery to you. This is what the Apostle Paul is doing, because he's going to say that there's fivefold ministry given for the purpose of setting in order the work of God to the church. And as an apostle, he had learned some things. He says, I want you to come alongside me. It's so important that you go alongside another believer, preferably somebody who's stronger than you are, that you go alongside and you find one who can exhort you and encourage you to go places you haven't been yet. The calling is necessary. It's the call of discipleship. Jesus sent them out two by two. The call of discipleship. The first is obedience. The second, he said, I beseech you, is, is the word exhortation. He wants us to walk in obedience and he wants us also to work in exhortation. Discipleship, the two by two process. Uh, I want to encourage you this morning, don't walk alone. When he says walk this way, he's saying don't walk all by yourself. When he exhorts to come alongside, he's saying don't walk all by yourself. Don't walk alone. Uh, Laura sent me a, a, a screenshot and texted it to me the other day and it was a Fox News or no, it was Time Magazine. Time Magazine has sent out, uh, you know, what, you know, if you have an iPhone, you get those updates from Time and from CNN and Fox News and, um, you know, I'll stop there. But uh, the, the, the time, it was time and it says that, um, uh, Where's my phone? Uh, large numbers of, of, of uh, Christians no longer going to church. And this trend is, looks like it's going to continue. Time Magazine saying this. I said, they're missing it. You're missing it. I'll just be blunt. You're missing it. That's not the call. The call is not to be all by yourself. The call is, is the call of, of walking this out together. Why? Because I need exhortation and you need exhortation. I need sharpening and you need sharpening. Iron sharpens iron, so a brother strengthens another brother. Amen? Mm. You know, when iron hits iron, it's sometimes friction. Sometimes there's sparks. But at the end, you get two sharp blades. Mm. You've got to learn to work through, work through conflict. You've got to learn to walk together in obedience to the will of God so that you don't get jaded by other people's personalities. Because some people are crazy and some people are are blood suckers. I mean, just like, to be honest with you. But you got to learn to keep a right mentality in it, that I'm, I'm in obedience to the will of God. I'm a prisoner of the Lord. I mean, I'm a prisoner. Like, I, I yeah, I got the right to remain silent, you know? <laughs> God would help us to exercise that right. I have the right to remain silent. Whatever I say, it can and it will be held against me in the court of law, the great white throne of uh, at the, at the uh, Bema Seat of Judgment and the Great White Throne of Judgment if I'm an unbeliever. It will. Every, by your words you will be justified and by your words you will be condemned. God, give me the right to remain silent. Amen? Teach me, Lord, how to love people without condition. Teach me how to encourage people, Lord God, when, when I myself need encouragement. You know, sometimes the greatest way to get encouragement is to encourage somebody. Just come alongside them, just encourage and bless them. Sometimes the greatest way out of the hole is to, 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 to give your way out. You say, that doesn't make any sense. Maybe you need to try it out. Sometimes the greatest way out of depression is just to love your way out. And just to, just to exercise the word of God in our lives, to be an exhorter. I beseech you, I come alongside to cry out for a purpose, because there's purpose behind it. See, the, the work of God is without, not without purpose. God... Everything he says in our life. See, some people argue with God. It's like, no, everything, it, you don't understand the process, but there's a purpose behind it. God, everything God asks us to do has a purpose behind it. God is a God of incredible purpose. Just look at everything that's in order. God is a God of purpose. We don't like process. We don't like going through the hard process. We like the good part of the process. We don't like the hard part of the process. But there's a purpose behind it all, and God wants us to learn to encourage people to continue to keep on going on because it's all for a reason. God's doing something as all things are working together for good to those who love God and call it according to his purpose. Amen? So he, he wants us to walk in obedience. He wants us to, to, to be exhorters. And, and finally, he wants us to walk worthy of the call. To walk worthy of the call. And, and he mentions four particular things. Humility, gentleness, patience, and unity. Humility, gentleness, patience, and unity. And I'll get there in just one moment, but, but the word walk in the Greek language is the word peripateo, peripateo, P-E-R-I-P-A-T-E-O, peripateo, another compound word. The word means to walk, to make one's way, to progress, to make due use of opportunities. It's the Hebrew word for live, to live. 
So to walk is to live. I want you to live worthy of the calling. Our walk is our life. Our walk is our character. We talked about last week, who we really are. That's our walk. How's your walk this week? It's how we conduct ourselves. It's a walk, our walk. I want you to walk worthy. The word walk, word walk here, a compound word made up of two words, peri, which means about, concerning, on account of, or because of. And so we can see the purpose behind there, right? This is why, concerning, of, on account of, because of, uh, peri, and then the word pateo. And the word pateo is the word to tread, to trample, to crush with the feet, to advance by setting foot upon. Uh, in fact, the word is used to encounter successfully the greatest perils from, from machinations and persecutions with which Satan would fain thwart the preaching of the gospel. It's, it's this idea of learning to encounter successfully attack. It's learning how to tread. It's learning, the, the word is a combination of concerning and with purpose to tread, to walk, to tread, to gain ground, to gain territory, to, to take and make advancement. That this is the word peripatia. I want you to walk. I want you to concerning treading. I want you to understand victorious living. I want you to understand what it is to be a conqueror. I want you to understand what it is to walk on top of things. See, Jesus said to, in, in, in the Gospel of Luke that I've, I've called you to the 70 he sent out to walk on, to tread upon serpents and, and scorpions and every evil thing that you have, have the ability to tread upon them, to walk upon them. See, there's no thing that can, it's just too hostile for us that we can't have the victory over it. Is anybody with me this morning? He wants us to learn concerning walking. He wants us to learn how to walk worthy of the calling with gentleness and humility. See, when you are thriving in your spiritual life, what is growing in your actually demeanor is humility, not pride. What is developing in your heart and your life is gentleness, not a rash and harshness. What's developing in your life is not a desire to exclude yourself because you're greater than everybody else. No, it's to unify yourself with the body of Christ for the purpose of exhortation. We mix this up. There's often this self-will worship and, and people isolate themselves. I hate it when ministers come in. They do their part and then they're off. That's not the gospel. Jesus didn't do that. He invested in the lives of people. With his humility, it says he, he was meek and lowly and humble. Jesus, and Paul says, this is the walk that I've learned. That the more I go on with God, the more the gentleness of Christ is manifested in my life. I'm not abrasive. There's something about his demeanor that actually encourages people to come to him. I've fallen into sin. No. Help me, please. And they'll find that there's grace there. Not a backhand. Grace. Grace. Because a walk's been learned is in humility and meekness and gentleness, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. That God's doing a work in our life. That, that, that those who are, who, are, who are strong should support those who are weak in their faith. When somebody falls into error, that, that we should restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, so that we should examine our own selves so that we don't fall into the same struggle. Learning what it is to, to walk together. God wants us to be a people who learn how to walk this way. Give me an amen if you're with me this morning. Amen. Walk worthy of the calling, to walk and to tread, to have victory. You know, uh, uh, Jesus said in Luke 9, 10, 19, Behold, I give you all authority to trample on serpents and scorpions over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Do you know that you're a, a devil-stomping, scorpion-kicking, <laughs> lion-chasing child of God? Do you not know that? I mean, you are. You are. You have to realize that so you can start walking it out. Some people, I mean, it's like, you see a spider, it's like, ah! I'm like, come on, dude, it's a spider. <laughs> and some people are like that with snakes. I'm like, it's a snake. Come on, just put them in a bucket and just go on our way. You know, it's, it's a snake, you know? And we get so, as Christians, like, it's a scorpion! <laughs> and we got to be that way with the devil. And the God of peace shall soon crush Satan underneath your feet. God will crush Satan underneath our feet. Our battle's not with the devil. You know what our battle is to do? Is to walk the walk that God has called us to do. The devil's going to put all kinds of landmines and such along the way. Say, you know what? My eyes are on Jesus. Forget this stuff. You know what? You're already done with. And I'm going to walk out the calling that God has placed on my life to tread on the things that I can tread upon. I'm going to walk a life that's victorious. Come on. Think about it for a minute. We've got to maintain our position. I'm, I was reading through the book of Joshua just because I'm thinking treading. I'm like, I want to just read Joshua again. Because it starts off, and right in the first chapter, and, and, and God says to Joshua, I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. What I did for Moses, I'm going to do for you. I'm, I'm like, 
If I was Josh, I'd be like, cha-ching. <laughs> like, God's going to walk with me like he walked with Moses. Like, I walked with Moses. Like, I saw the things that God did in Moses' life. Like, people try to come against him, and God was like, uh-uh. <laughs> and God's like, I'm going to be on your side like I was with Moses. Josh was like, I think I can do this. You with me? Amen. The Holy Spirit's been poured out on us. And it says that I'm going to give you all the places that the sole of your foot touches. That territory is going to become yours. Everywhere you tread, everywhere you tread is going to become territory that becomes yours. It's a lot of territory for you. We got to walk this way. See, and he lays out this whole land geography that belongs to Israel. If he would tread upon it, guess what? The children of Israel never occupied all the land that God had given to them. Ephesians chapter one says, you've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And then he goes on to say, walk worthy of the calling. He's like, in other words, tread upon the places, walk upon the places that have been given to you. Don't surrender your position. Maintain your position. Take your position. Gain that territory. Acquire what's been given to you by God. Amen. You don't have to earn it. It's been given. Amen. It's been given. Now grasp it. Take hold of it. Anybody with me this morning? Amen. Take what's been given to you. And maintain the humble attitude that this has been a gift by God. I live in grace. And so thanksgiving is my response. Is anybody with me this morning? Some people say, oh, I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Well, Paul said to the Romans in chapter 6, verse 4, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should walk in newness of life. In newness of life, we should walk circumspectly. We should walk uh, purposefully. Amen? We should walk in the light. In Joshua chapter 3 and chapter 4, it mentions that the priest, that... Um, that they carried the ark, and I'm going to closing, this is a closing thought, that they carried the ark. The priests carried the ark, and they were required to carry out, and, and they were called, told to tread into the waters before the waters resided in the, in the Jordan River. And they were called to tread upon the water. And they were carrying the ark. And as soon as their foot touched... It said the waters rolled back. When you're carrying glory, you ain't running. When you're carrying glory, you're paying attention. When you're carrying glory, wherever you go is moving out of your way. We are glory carriers. We are priests. We are carrying the presence of God. There's nothing that can stand before us. He's called us to tread some place. He said, walk this way. Walk worthy of the calling this morning. Is anybody with me this morning? Amen. When you're carrying something, when you're carrying something, you got to just walk with the confidence that God said, this is the way it will be. Anybody this morning say, you know what? I need a renewed vision in my walk. Would you just stand up this morning? We're just going to pray.